Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HDSA and Me, a virtual educational series for the HD community. Today, we welcome Drs. Valerie Susky and Morgan Fader from our HDSA Center of Excellence at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. They will be talking with you today about when to do a psychiatric evaluation. You can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit send. Your question will be answered at the end of the session. This presentation will be available in about a week on HDSA's YouTube channel. On November 12th, we'll be talking about strategies to survive with HD during the pandemic. You can register for this session by going to hdsa.org backslash hdsa hyphen me. And now a little about our speakers. Dr. Valerie Susky is an Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Pittsburgh. She completed her neurology residency at the Medical College of Virginia and her Movement Disorders Fellowship at Duke University. Dr. Susky has been the director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at UPMC since 2015. She is also the clinical director of the UPMC Movement Disorders Division and the co-director of the UPMC Movement Disorders Fellowship. Her professional interests include botulinum toxin injections, deep brain stimulator surgery programming, teaching, and clinical trials. Dr. Morgan Fader is an assistant professor of psychiatry and neurology at the University of Pittsburgh and consultation liaison psychiatry fellowship program director at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He received his PhD in chemical physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder, went on to get his MD at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He did his residency in psychiatry and consultation liaison psychiatry fellowship at UPMC Western Psychiatric Hospital. He is currently the medical director of neuropsychiatry and is a psychiatrist at the HDSA Center of Excellence. His professional interests include neuropsychiatry, integrated care, medical education, and LGBTQ healthcare. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Susky and Fader here today, and I'll turn the presentation over to them now. Well, I'm glad my bio uh, wasn't following Dr. Fader's because it sounds a lot more important than mine. So I'd like to acknowledge um, the HDSA for putting on a great program like this. Um, it's, you know, bringing and interacting and collaborating with the physicians and getting the, you know, HD community together. So I think that's a very interesting um, program. And I think this is a great avenue that we need to keep up and keep on going with. Um, so we're going to start the presentation um, with a little bit of a talk, and then we're going to do the, the question and answer afterwards. Um, and hopefully I'm not going to be the uh, Dr. Fader driving the motorcycle, but in myself as being in that sidecar, um, but hopefully we're going to do this together. Um, and so I would also like to thank um, Deb Lavecki and the HDSA, the HD community, and Dr. Fader for, for doing this with us today. So we have no financial disclosures. Even though we may want some, we don't have any financial disclosures. So as we all know that HD is a very complicated disease, I usually say that no two brains are the same in general, um, but we can't compare uh, even patients in the same family of how they act or how they move. Um, and we usually treat them individually. Um, when I have somebody coming in uh, to the clinic, I usually look for three major areas to see if we can do um, treatments or, or interventions. And those are my three M's. So movements, and usually what we see is um, choreiform movements, but it can be any abnormal movements, mood or uh, anxiety, depression, irritability, behavioral changes, or memory problems, um, or the way that the patient thinks. And the, you know, because it's so complicated, that's why these centers have um, a multidisciplinary team because you need people to help out in all different avenues to help out with these patients and their quality of life. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susky, and, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Um, you <laughs> heard my bio and then Dr. Susky talking me up. I should point out that she helped train me, so maybe she gets some of the credit. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about psychiatric hospitalization for patients with Huntington's disease, and I'm going to start off with just a short history of psychiatric hospitalization to sort of put it all in context. Um, uh, on the right, you can see a picture of an, an old old school psychiatric hospital, state hospital, which actually looks really nice, come to think of it, not what I would think of as, as a hospital. Um, but 
what we're talking about when we're talking about psychiatric hospitalization and why it differs so much from a medical hospitalization is that psychiatric illness, including psychiatric consequences of medical illness like Huntington's disease is really unique in that um, it affects a patient's ability to think about how they're behaving, right? So they may not have very much insight into what's going on or if they're having dangerous behaviors um, and their judgment also may be pretty poor. So people who really need help and, and could be helped um, with medication or different kinds of therapies may not really understand that they need it and may not be willing to accept it even if they, they have some insight into the fact that there's something wrong. And so when we, we, can, we can admit people involuntarily, which is not something we generally do with, with medical illness, right? And so that allows somebody else to say, hey, this person really needs some help and to get them into the hospital to get that help. And throughout history and, and still now, there's this tension between what we call a right to treatment, basically that everybody deserves to have their illness treated and to get better. So basically in the best in interest of the patient, and you know the tension between that and autonomy, where the patient you know gets to make decisions for themselves. Um, and so when we're when we're dealing with this tension, um, what we're generally dealing with is civil commitment laws. So the states uh, have laws about how somebody can be admitted to a psychiatric facility against their will. Every state has different laws, but they're all basically based on the same legal theory. So there's this, this uh, legal phrase, parents patriae, which is basically um, the state as, as parent, right? So this is talking about that right to treatment, people um, deserving to get treatment and get better. Um, and then versus another legal theory, which is called police power, which is mostly uh, focused on limiting danger to society from the behavior of other people. And until about the middle of the last century, most statutes were based on a right to treatment. So basically on treating the individual so that they, they can get better and, and go on with their life. Um, but now there's a growing trend towards more uh, regulations to safeguard patients' rights. And so um, shifting more towards autonomy. And so um, in the past, uh, before the middle of the last century and up, up till then, um, institutionalization was common. Um, there were up to actually more than 500,000 people admitted to psychiatric hospitals in 1953. That's a lot of people and a lot of people who didn't necessarily want to be there and maybe by um, our thinking today didn't need to be there. Um, when patients had a psychiatric illness or, or behavioral disturbance, they were thought really not to have the right to make decisions for themselves. And family members could have somebody admitted to the hospital based only on a diagnosis, but not actually on, on any behaviors. Um, that started to change again in the middle of the last century when um, medications were developed. Uh, the first antipsychotic was developed in 1950. Medications developed um, that gave people hope of being able to have patients treated successfully in the community um, and keep them at home. In the 1960s, the civil rights, rights movement um, as, as one of the sort of byproducts led to people thinking about the rights of patients and, and what uh, they could expect from society and what, what we can and, and can't do, what decisions we can and can't make for other people. Um, another side of this is legislators looking to cut budgets. So the state hospital systems were, were pretty expensive. Um, and it was, it was seen as a place where, where states could save money. Um, so there was the closure of the majority of state hospitals in, in basically all of the states, but certainly in um, Pennsylvania where, where we practice. Um, I think by the end of the last century, most of them were closed. We have a few left um, and they're not generally long-term institutionalization uh, facilities any longer. And so, this, um, at the same time, the states decided that this right to treatment was not really the way they wanted to have people admitted to the hospital. They focused more on this dan imminent danger. So imminent danger to oneself, imminent danger to others, or an inability to care for, for yourself in your current environment. So somebody say, who's not not eating, um, losing a lot of weight, like clearly just isn't caring for themselves, um, maybe not taking medications that they need to survive, those kinds of things. And this generally was a positive shift. I mean, it, it led to more people being cared for at home, um, fewer people in the hospital when they didn't need to be, and pay people's rights being preserved, which are all good things. But um, 
at the same time, it also made it hospital for, uh, excuse me, it made it harder for people who really needed to be in the hospital to get there. Um, and also it made it more difficult to connect people with treatment um, when they really needed it, even before they got to the hospital. So now it's often the patients will get their first care, first psychiatric care, when they've been admitted to the hospital and that that's their, their entry into the uh, psychiatric system. Um, you know, family members might need to get, might need to watch somebody get um, progressively more ill before they get help. So they may know that their, their family member is not doing well and really needs care and really needs some treatment, but the family member is not agreeing to that and there's no way to compel them to get treatment. Um, and this can be really stressful for, for families to see somebody uh, really suffering and not, not able to get help. Um, it's also led to increases in psychiatrically ill people in jails and prisons. Um, I think the largest psychiatric hospital in the country, it, it varies depending on when it is. It's either the Los Angeles County Jail or the uh, Cook County Jail in Chicago, um, which is not not the way it should be. People should have access to care um, before they end up in, in prison um, or in, in jail in that case. And we find that 25% of, of homeless people have severe mental illness versus about 6% of the general population. So we push people out of hospitals and sometimes onto the street when we haven't been able to care for them in the community. So- Go back one slide first. This is you? Yeah, that's me, but go yeah. back one slide. One slide, got it. So this is Western Psychiatric Hospital that's attached to uh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, it is um, a wonderful hospital. It is connected to our, our university hospitals. Um, there is a, I mean, fortunate for us, there's a, an, an ER, there's an ICU, um, and that's not, you know, available at a lot of other places. So I just wanted to say how beautiful of a facility this is. You didn't to say what it was. <laughs> oh right, I, that's true. I, I the other ones I said were nice. This is yes, this is the modern. This is ours, yeah. Yeah, and this is, is ours. <laughs> All right. So fortunate for me, and unfortunate for Dr. Fader, uh, he is on speed dial for me. And so, you know, the earlier that we know um, that something is going on with the patients, if the behaviors are starting to get out of control, the earlier that we can do interventions as an outpatient. Um, and it could be from changing a medication, doing a little tweak, or looking at infections, like looking for infections, um, looking to see if there's something in the environment that has changed. Um, but we try to keep the hospitalization as our last option. And this is mainly to preserve safety. And so admission can be voluntary, meaning that the patient is um, going in themselves um, or involuntary. And that can be, um, you know, recommendations from a physician, a police officer, somebody in the community, uh, family members as well. Um, each state has their own laws that govern admissions and the psychiatric team that you are associated with should be able to know what your own state laws are. So usually the, the hospitalizations are shorter stays and that's usually when someone's at risk of harming themselves or harming um, others, like there's a risk for harming others. Um, Sometimes there are longer hospitalizations and that's usually whenever um, someone's not able to take care of themselves at home um, and they're looking at possible placement or trying to get their medications really um, uh, tweaked and, and um, uh, better so they can go home. But usually the, the hospitalizations are shorter. Okay, all right, I'm gonna pick back up here. And so, you know, a lot of times people are really hesitant to have a family member admitted to the psychiatric hospital because it's kind of a black box. Like they really don't know what's gonna happen. Um, it's kind of a scary proposition because when, when people go in, they really can't leave until they're discharged. Um, and so just <laughs> introducing people to the process can, can sort of demystify it and make it a lot less scary for people. And so there are a number of different ways that you could end up um, being being admitted to a psychiatric hospital. So often somebody will be first admitted to a medical hospital. Um, you know, they may may have um, a urinary tract infection that leads to uh, some 
basically metabolic derangements. So, and they, they get medically admitted because they need to have that cleared up, but they still have some behavioral problems that, that need to be taken care of. And so they get transferred to the psychiatric hospital. They could be admitted directly by their outpatient care team. So it could be that um, if they have a psychiatrist on the outpatient care team, that they have admitting privileges at a hospital and they could admit them directly from, from their outpatient office. Um, sometimes people will go to the emergency room and after the evaluation by the emergency physicians, it's determined that, that the, the best place to admit them would be the psychiatric hospital. Um, sometimes uh, families or, or others will call a community crisis team because there's a crisis in the home or um, in the community somewhere and the community crisis team will facilitate somebody being taken to the hospital for an evaluation and then possibly being admitted. And then sort of at, at, at the least preferred option would be um, the police are called because of you know, some behaviors that are concerning to people in the community. Um, we really would, would prefer that, that this is not the way that people get to the hospital because there are all sorts of things that can go wrong when, when the police are involved with somebody who may have behavioral issues. It's not just, just Huntington's, but, but other people who have similar, similar behaviors. Um, and so on the, the right here, there's a, a card that the HDSA uh, has available um, that can familiarize people, really anybody, you can use it with the police, but you could use it with anybody with um, some of the, the aspects of Huntington's disease that people can find disturbing if they don't know that the patient has an illness. And so this can, uh, can ward off a lot of, a lot of trouble if, if you carry one of these around with you to explain what's going on. Um, it prevents people from being mistaken for being intoxicated in some way. And, and that, that can really go a long way. Um, and then, so when you're admitted to the psychiatric hospital, there are some restrictions. Um, and you need, need to expect that, that those are gonna be in place. Um, first off is that you, you need, um, the, the units are locked uh, in most states. And some, actually I think in Vermont, they don't have any locked units, but I think everywhere else there are locked units, um, which means that nobody off the street can wander in and um, you know, disturb the, the patients on the unit. And also, but people also need to be discharged before they can leave. They need to have the okay of their physicians before they can go. And this is to preserve everybody's safety. Um, we wanna make sure that somebody who um, is being, being is, is coming out of the hospital isn't at high risk of hurting themselves or somebody else when they're leaving. Um, we also wanna know that they're going somewhere safe uh, when they're leaving. And so um, other limitations are um, belongings are limited um, for a number of different reasons. Um, phones are, are not allowed uh, mostly because of privacy reasons because phones all have cameras on them and we don't want people taking pictures and then texting them to their friends. That would be a huge gross violation of, of people's privacy. Um, other electronics are also typically not allowed um, a lot because um, they have batteries and people will swallow them and that's dangerous. So we want to keep dangerous objects away from people, um, sharp objects, belts, shoelaces, um, for fairly obvious reasons. And if you're in this situation, a hospital will provide a list of things that, that are okay and things that aren't okay. Um, often visitation can be limited. Um, now because of COVID, um, here we have one person who's allowed to visit at a time. Um, and I think the hours are a little bit more restricted than they used to be. Um, people can't visit typically during quiet hours or sometimes during times when patients are getting uh, specific treatments. So if there are, there's group therapy going on or you know various things that they're doing with the patients, they don't want people visiting them because then they're interrupting the treatment and we wanna get people better. Um, and so who are you going to encounter in the hospital? Um, well, you'll encounter a lot of people. <laughs> um, so psychiatrist, um, a, an internist or a family medicine doc, psychologists, social workers, nurses, um, people called milieu therapists who are basically people who are available at any time for, for the patients to talk to if they, if they need to. Um, and then you can have consulting specialists like neurologists, you can have physical and occupational therapists, speech therapists, dietitians. all of these people are available to the patients in the hospital. Okay, and did I just do a slide extra? <laughs> I think I did, yeah. is this one yours? Sorry. 
That's okay. Um, so as you can see, there's a very long list of the people that are in the hospital that are a part of your team. Um, we also have the potential, the HDSA Center of Excellence that is a, a part of the team as well. You know, depending on if your center is a, associated with the psychiatric hospitals, I mean, for instance, we have gone into the hospitals ourselves and, and seen patients and educated the, the treatment team because there might have been something that, that they need to consider that they didn't think about, such as is the person you know, irritable because they're not getting enough calories. So we do a little education too with the treatment team. Um, I know uh, from myself and Dr. Fader, we have no problems with other physicians if they're not attached with Western Psych Hospital, if they call us and say that they have a question. So we answer phone calls and sometimes we go in and depending on if your center is, is a, associated with a psychiatric hospital, but you know, there is an inpatient team, but also potentially your outpatient team could help out too. Okay, and then let's see. And then in terms of in terms of treatment, um, what to expect is that days are actually fairly full when when um, when you're admitted to the hospital. You can see there's a, a sample schedule off to the right there, and it's um, it's pretty packed, full of things. A lot of group therapy, a lot of um, learning different kinds of skills to help people be successful once they leave the hospital. So. Um, uh, you know, there's there's going to be a daily meeting with the psychiatrist um, and adjustment of medications is needed, but that's actually a relatively short uh, period of time compared to the, the entire period of time that somebody is there. The group therapy will take up um, the bulk of the time that somebody is in the hospital. Um, there's always individual support um, in real time as needed 24-7. Uh, so somebody can be up in the middle of the night and, and have trouble and there's always somebody there to talk to. Um, what you, you need to expect that there will be regular communication with family and caregivers. Um, if, if that's not happening, then that's something you need to ask for, but that's something that should happen um, during every admission and also involvement of specialty care when appropriate. So um, uh, Dr. Susky and I go visit um, all of our patients when they get admitted. And so they, they automatically get a neurologist who, com who comes, comes to see them, but it's a good idea to have um, if, if you can, your neurologist involved, but to have neurology lay eyes on, on a patient with, with HD when they're in the hospital, because not all psychiatrists have a lot of training in some of the particulars of, of Huntington's. Um, okay, and other things to expect, um, it links to resources. So if you don't already have outpatient mental health services, um, connection to those, um, some outpatient medical services that you might not already have can be facilitated. Um, and then, if, um, if the, pa the patient wasn't successful at home and it, it seems like they're gonna need more support than, than what they had living at home, um, you know, there can be home health care that's, that's arranged or um, placement at, for assisted living, personal care home or nursing home or a more supportive living situation if that's needed. And then um, also can be linked to resources for caregiver support to help people um, you know, cope with their family member's illness and be, have them be more successful at home or, or just facilitate those relationships a little bit better. Um, and so, so challenges, particularly for people with, with HD and, and uh, caregivers, you might need to educate providers about Huntington's. It's a fairly rare illness and not everybody is going to have a lot of experience with it. And as Dr. Susky said before, we don't, you know, no two brains are the same. So no two people with, with Huntington's have, you know, the same, it doesn't look the same in everybody. It can look very different in different people. Um, and it's also important to notice that it might not be clear that it's Huntington's that's causing the problem. Um, and so it could be somebody who has Huntington's and also has depression, but they had depression before they developed any symptoms of Huntington's. And it's, it's that depression that's, that's sort of causing the problem. Um, substance use is also common in people with Huntington's as it is in the general population. So sometimes we're dealing with sort of relatively ordinary things in someone who has Huntington's. And sometimes we're dealing with um, manifestations of the Huntington's disease, and it can be tricky to tell those things apart. Um, and so, you know, uh, the, uh, the family caregivers and the patient can often really aid their treatment team in figuring out whether the issue is Huntington's or the issue is actually something else based on sort of the history and, and, and how the disease has progressed thus far.
Um, and so this is just a patient that we took care of. Um, FP are not his actual initials. He's a 60 year old man. He's gene positive for Huntington's, but he didn't have many motor symptoms at the time. Um, and he was brought into the psychiatric emergency room by the crisis team. So he um, was in a bar and he told the bartender that he wanted to run in front of a bus. Um, he happened to be drunk at the time and the bartender called the, the county crisis team. Um, he had several past suicide attempts, had several psychiatric hospitalizations, um, was a heavy drinker, used other substances if he could get his hands on them, um, lived alone. Uh, his, his mom was the one with HD and she was actually diagnosed very late in life. So, which is, um, it was kind of a shock to the family that HD was, was present in the family. Um, and also his brother had been recently diagnosed with a different devastating illness. Um, and so he was pretty, <laughs> pretty upset about this. And then he, the next day he feels much better. Um, and so it's, it's important to note that um, suicidality is really common in people with Huntington's up to 20% or sorry, 20 times higher than the general population um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, Huntington's will increase impulsivity. Depression is more common in Huntington's than it is in the general population. And that's because of changes to the brain in Huntington's and also because it can be difficult to live with Huntington's and um, you know, knowing your, the family history and being around it can be a lot of stress in, in somebody's life as well. Um, substance use tends to be more common in Huntington's, although it's pretty common among everybody. And so all of those things add up to risk of suicide being higher in a person with Huntington's than in somebody who doesn't have Huntington's. Um, and so this patient was ad admitted to the hospital, ended up feeling just fine the next day. Um, and so what we can, what we can think is, well, okay, the fact that he was drunk probably wasn't helping. Um, and the, he probably had some increased impulsivity from the Huntington's as well, where it's sort of people will have kind of fleeting thoughts of doing something that they're really going to regret later. And one of those things can be suicide. So that was the thing that needed to be accounted for with him. So the one thing that we, we make sure because of the impulsivity, um, is if, you know, if you have firearms at the house, even if you lock, um, them up and have someone else hold on to the key just by a couple more minutes of trying to get to the key, you know, that thought might be gone. Um, same with, you know, potentially alcohol too, um, you know, just so you're, you're limiting um, harm during those times of impulsivity, just giving them a couple more seconds to, to actually think about it. It's just it's sometimes all that you need. Yeah, the good good point. Sometimes, yeah, just putting a, an obstacle in front of the thing that's dangerous can be really helpful. And here in Western Pennsylvania, just about everybody has firearms, so it's something that we need to be fairly fairly careful about. Um, there's there's a, a a hunting culture, a gun culture around here that um, is pretty significant to people, so they often don't want to give up their firearms. And at the same time, you know, they can usually educate people about how to make it how to how to have guns safely, um, which is which is a, an important conversation for us to be having. Sometimes distraction also helps with um, impulsivity too. So if there's something that they really like for, you know, everybody here in Pittsburgh likes the Steelers, I mean, just even like, you know, conversing about who their favorite Steeler is or something like that may also give them more time where that thought has gone. Especially since they're six and oh now, I think, right? Seven so, and oh, I think. Good year. <laughs> Um, see, I was distracted by it. It works. <laughs> um, and so when the, the big question often is when do we seek inpatient care? Um, and the, the simple answer is when safety is, is an issue. Um, things like, so suicidal thoughts, especially if there's, um, a, the, a plan or, or somebody takes initiative towards, um, implementing a plan. So somebody who, um, has a, a fleeting thought of, oh, well, I wish I wouldn't wake up tomorrow morning. And then they sort of move on is much less of a danger. We call that passive death wish. So um, they kind of wish they were dead, but they wouldn't do, ever do anything about it. Um, is much that, so that person's much less of a danger to themselves than somebody who says, no, I, I actually really want to do something to, to hurt myself. I really want to kill myself. Um, and then that person is less of, a, less of a danger than somebody who says, I really want to die and this is how I'm going to do it. Okay. And then at the extreme end of danger is I really want to die. This is how I'm going to do it. 
and I've gone out and taken steps to make that happen. So maybe bought a gun when they didn't have one before, stockpiled medications, those kind of things. So on the, um, on the less extreme end, we can often take care of people um, in the outpatient setting. And on the more extreme end, then we're thinking this person probably needs to be in the hospital. And if there's um, a, a medication that the patient has um, that could um, do harm if um, hoarded and then taken in mass quantities or, or just taken the whole bottle, I mean, the other thing is you potentially can have somebody in charge of that particular medication to, to hand out. Um, yeah, that helps with impulsivity as well. If somebody has impulsive thoughts to overdose on a medication, it can be, can be that what you need is to have somebody else giving the patient the medication as they need it and not, not having the patient have access to all the medication. Um, we're also gonna be thinking about admitting people when they um, have self-injury. So people who they may be impulsively injuring themselves or they may um, be trying to relieve tension by, by injuring themselves. Um, but if they're putting themselves in danger and, and we're worried about them, then that would be another reason to, to admit them. Um, aggression towards others. Um, which can also go along with the impulsivity um, and can, can also be a reason to admit somebody if we're worried about somebody else's safety. And often in those situations, we're worried about the patient's safety and somebody else's safety. It's not, not usually just one person in those situations. And then lastly, inability to, to care for oneself or be cared for in their current living situation. So that could be um, anything from somebody who, who lives alone and just doesn't um, doesn't have the caregiver support in order to um, you know feed themselves appropriately. I mean, uh, we know that that people with Huntington's tend to have higher caloric re requirements than than people without. Um, can be a challenge to get all the food in sometimes. Um, and so it could be somebody who lives alone who who needs in home support and isn't really able to get it, or it could be somebody who has um, a lot of support in their in their home. They have caregivers who come in. Um, but still they're not being successful. They may be thing, doing things like refusing medications. They may be, um, you know, just, just, it may be not possible to care for them in where they are and then they can be admitted to the hospital and we can um, sort of optimize that, either make it in some way easier for them to, to be in their current situation or escalate them to some kind of higher level of care when they, when they leave. The other thing is if any of these uh, on the list are happening and you're not sure, is there self-injury because they're trying to harm themselves or is this like an OCD tendency or, you know, is there suicidal thoughts fleeting, you know, just contact your, your physician and, you know, let us help tease that out. It shouldn't be, you know, totally on you um, to try to figure this out. I mean, there's, there's a lot more into it that, in, that we can help out with. So just, contact your physician too. Right. And sometimes we can, we can get resources to you without having to, to, to do a, a psychiatric admission as well. We can often, you know, get people emergency appointments and, and things like that if, if they need them. Um, and let's see, so how do we avoid inpatient care, which I think is probably the most important thing. Um, well, the, the number one thing is to have an outpatient care team that's that, that you're working with. So establish um, care, early on, um, if there are any behavioral concerns. Um, it, it's, it's best, I think, if there's a psychiatrist with the neurologist um, if, so we can work together. Uh, that makes things a lot easier. Um, but if not, having care with a psychiatrist, preferably somebody who is familiar with, with Huntington's disease, and that might be, um, might be difficult to, to find sometimes, but often I know I do a lot of um, consulting for other psychiatrists in the area who have patients with Huntington's. And if they're unfamiliar, they'll give me a call and say, hey, you know, can you help me out with this? So sometimes you can, you can have somebody who's just getting guidance from somebody who's more expert in, in treating people with Huntington's. Um, the other thing is, is building a support network. So it could be family, friends, paid care caregivers, resources through the HDSA um, that, that can, you know, build support around a patient. Um, really pay attention to, to mood, pay attention to how, how, how the patient is feeling. Um, make, make sure that, that if they're feeling, you know, down or if they're, they seem depressed, that, that they're having attention paid to that um, to prevent it from getting worse um, before it 
the need for hospitalization is there. Um, also really watch for things like impulsivity and apathy. Impulsivity tends to be more dangerous on the sort of acute, now I'm, now I'm in danger sort of thing, either with suicidality or self-injury or, you know, any, you know, aggression, those kind of things. But apathy can lead to that inability to care for oneself. Uh, kind of picture that can also result in hospitalization and just realize sometimes that inpatient hospitalization is unavoidable, that, um, that we really need to bring somebody in and have a good look at them over a period of time in order to make, you know, give them the treatment that's right for them. Um, so and if, that, if you all don't know what apathy is, apathy, I always call it my get up and go has gone up and went. It's the motivation center. And this is something that can be affected with HD. Um, so Sometimes it can also look like like a severe depression because they're not wanting to get up and they just want to watch TV all day long and you think that they're depressed, but really it's just this apathy. But once again, this is something that your physicians can also try to tease out too. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like apathy is, they're perfectly content to be doing whatever it is that they're doing and don't have much motivation to do anything else. And so that can look to, it can look like um, depression and you know, also can cause people not to do things that they really need to be doing to care for themselves. Um, and just recognize that, you know, needing an inpatient psychiatric hospital is, hospitalization isn't a failure. It's not because um, the, the patient hasn't been doing the things they need to be doing. It's not because uh, family or caregivers haven't been attentive enough or doing enough. Um, sometimes it's just something that we need to do in order to, to set people up to succeed outside the hospital. Um, so it's really important to recognize that, that it's not a failure on anybody's, on anybody's part. Um, and then things to ask the, um, the either physicians who are recommending um, psychiatric admission or the, the physicians in the hospital um, to give you a, a better idea of what's going on and to help you make decisions. Um, you always want to know what the goal of an admission is. I mean, really, you want to know what the goal of any kind of treatment is, but you want to know what what it what are we looking at here? Are we trying to change medications? Are we trying to get more services um, in the outpatient basis? Or is this an acute stabilization for somebody, say, who's got um, concerning suicidality or, or something like that? What are we expecting to accomplish? Um, you know, always want to know risks versus benefits of treatments that are being recommended. Um, usually there aren't very many risks to going into the hospital, but they may recommend new medications, um, different kinds of treatments that you want to know uh, what, what you're looking at in terms of risks and benefits. Um, you want to know what you're going to be able to do after discharge. So, uh, okay, you've changed the medications. We're still seeing, say, some impulsivity. It's not completely gone or, or the patient um, still has some depression. What do we do now? Um, now that they're coming home, uh, when, when these behaviors happen or when these symptoms pop up, you know, what should we be watching out for in the future is related to that. And then also what resources are there to help us that we don't know about, you know, who can you connect us with so that if we have problems, we know who to call. And so that's the last one. Who do we call if we have a problem? Um, and I think with that, um, Let's see, Dr. Susky, do you have anything you want to yeah, add? Yeah, I just want um, to have you kind of talk about the crisis teams. So in, in Pennsylvania, at least, we have crisis teams in different counties. So, you know, I, 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 I'm hopeful that this is other places, but um, uh, so the benefits of having a crisis, crisis team uh, for our patients is that, you know, if, if the families are not able to, to assess and we need to get some like to have the patient be assessed by someone else and they're refusing to come into the, the hospital or into um, the office, we can call the crisis team. And if you can explain what they do. Yeah, that's another a, a good point. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, oh yeah, we left a good amount of time for questions. So um, I'm not sure, should we stop sharing the screen or how are we doing this? You can leave the screen as it is. Leave it? Um, okay. We do have a few questions that came in through the chat box. Uh, we'll start with the earliest one because it has to do with uh, something that appeared in early in the presentation, and that's um, how can one get a blue I have HD card? So there are two ways you can do it. One, you can contact the national office, go online um, to order one. I also believe you can download the image of it um, from the national website. Um, but you can contact me at dlebecky at hdsa.org. 
um, if you'd like uh, an IFHD card and we can get those off to you. Um, the second question is, um, what are some strategies that families can use when their loved one doesn't want to take the medication? Right. Do you so want to start? I guess there's a couple different things. Um, and that's why uh, Dr. Fader is on speed dial for me. Uh, sometimes we, we change medications um, that are longer acting. So whenever they're taking medications, um, that we might get something in them that would last a little longer, or there's also injectables um, that can last up to a month. They're actually about to approve one for six months, nice. <laughs> which is, I don't know, I don't know when, when insurance is going to pay for it, but yeah, there are the injectables. There are also different strategies for, um, for getting people to take their medications. Um, sometimes, uh, they actually, you can put them in a food that the patient likes. It's never our preferred choice to give somebody medication that, that they don't know that they're getting. Um, we really like to respect people's autonomy. Um, at the same time, there are, there are instances where, um, you know, people really need the medication, don't necessarily have a good understanding of what it's for, um, or, you know, why they're taking it and we kind of need to get it into them. So sometimes you can mix it with the food that the patient likes, um, often something like pudding or, or something like that. And that can be really helpful. Um, you have to watch out. Some of them taste really bad. So sometimes it just, it, it, it doesn't work all that well, but that's another, another strategy. What are some options that families can use when their loved one doesn't want help or thinks they don't need help? That's the, the um, $10,000 question, million dollar question. Um, right, Some, sometimes um, uh, it is the awareness. Um, so, you know, I usually start off the interview with how are you and everything is fine. And you can see the family member shaking their head beside them. Um, sometimes it's just the insight that there is a, an issue. Um, um, yeah, I mean, when we're in clinic, we try to make things positive, like we're trying to, like, this is your team and, and um, try to keep it a little bit more positive. Um, but you're, it, it, that is a, a hard thing to. Often you can identify something that the patient is bothered by um, and then motivate them to say, to take a medication um, if that's what they need based on that. So. Um, often when somebody has depression, for example, they'll also have trouble sleeping and they may not see that they have depression, but they may realize that they're not sleeping well and they'd really like help with that. Um, then we might choose a, an antidepressant medication that also helps somebody sleep. So they have the motivation to take the medication because they want to sleep better. Um, and then at the same time, it'll help to improve their mood. Um, the same, sometimes medications for impulsivity, also the same thing. Um, if somebody's having trouble sleeping, these, there are some of them, if we give them at bedtime, they'll help people sleep um, and they can be motivated based on that. Yeah, sometimes it depends it on, pill. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it depends on who the, the patient has a good relationship with. So there may be a member of the treatment team or even a member of the family or, or a particular caregiver who is just more effective at talking to them about, you know, what it is that they need, convincing them to do things. Um, and so we may, you know, pull somebody in and say, Hey, you've got a really good relationship with this person. You know, will you talk to them about this? And sometimes that will, that will help as well. Following up on uh, the uh, aspect of unawareness, there's a question. My brother has unawareness, but it's so hard to describe to even medical professionals, any suggestions, even a neurologist he saw didn't get it and was very negative. I think I need more more information. Explain that one once. Say it one more time. Yeah. Sure, my brother has unawareness, but it's so hard to describe it even to medical professionals. Do you have any suggestions? Neurologist he saw didn't understand it and was very negative. Yeah. Um, so I wish that all physicians were very well versed in Huntington's. And unfortunately, we do get a lot of unusual comments that people will make of what experience they had. Um, 
sometimes it's it's seeing if there's a, a center of excellence in your area that you, they may understand it a little better. Um, nowadays, we're doing a lot more telemedicine, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to physically get there. Um, it could just be that you log on and get someone who understands a little bit better. And most of the centers are going to be very willing to reach out to these local local physicians. It's one of our jobs to, to do local education, too, for these people. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, not all physicians are good. Right. It also sounds a little bit like unawareness on the part of the neurologist as well, maybe as the, on the part of the patient, which yeah. is not a good combination. Um, yeah. I mean, so just when I was trained with, when I was in residency, I mean, we knew about the, the bigger things to look out for, for Huntington's, but um, then I'm going to say the local people are going to know just the basic stuff. So things like apathy and self-awareness issues are probably not going to be things that they were taught in their training just because I've been through training before. Um, but that's where, you know, your, your HDSA sites can help out. Thank you. We have a two-part question now. The first part is, do people with HD understand what it means to have HD? My 41-year-old niece has HD. It's amazing what she remembers with such clarity in one minute, and the next she thinks she's enrolled in a PT class at the local university. Would she understand divorce, for example? Would she understand the last part? Would she understand divorce, for example? Oh, divorce, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, it's, it's hard to say what some, an individual would understand um, without actually talking to them about the, the specific issue. Um, it's because it's possible for people really to understand and be able to make decisions about one thing and something else that may seem um, like less involved, they actually won't have that, the same ability to do that. So it, it's really hard to say. Um, in general, with with HD memory is usually pretty well preserved. Um, you know, it's not, you know, thinking can be, can be difficult, but they'll remember things. Um, and it really also depends on what stage of the illness somebody is in. Yeah, and I, I, it's hard to say just because everybody's so different. Um, but the, the, the self-awareness could be a, a problem and that could be from hygiene to I'm able to drive or I'm able to work, um, that I'm having problems with my balance and I'm falling and I need something to help me walk. Um, but it, that's definitely an individual thing. So not everybody's the same. And the second part of this question is um, how capable would she be of actually acting on a suicidal thought as her progressive. She was hospitalized twice for suicidal actions and early in her diagnosis, but not recently. Um, there are two times when people are at greatest risk of suicide, um, which doesn't mean that they're not at risk at other times, but the times of greatest risk in patients with Huntington's are when they first receive their diagnosis and when they are becoming um, more disabled so they can't care for themselves. Uh, well, when they when they really need other people to to be caring for them. Um, that said, uh, just because somebody has had um, suicidal thoughts or actions in the past doesn't mean they will in the future. Although it's more likely, um, and just because somebody hasn't had them in the past doesn't mean they won't have them in the future. I would um, almost never assume that somebody could not act on suicidal thoughts, um, just because the consequences are so extreme. Um, so always pay attention to that, definitely. But as uh, we have seen with patients as, as the disease progresses, that um, their behaviors completely change. Um, so I mean, it's, it's just something that we have to always assess for whenever they're coming into the, the office. Um, because sometimes you just, the one time we, we don't ask, you know, they may be having issues. Yeah. And, and, and people are capable of acting on, on suicidal thoughts, even when you might not think that they are um, sometimes. Uh, so it, 
being careful with that is, is, um, is wise. Our next question is um, about hospitalization. When would we expect most HD patients, oh, I'm sorry, would we expect most HD patients to require a psych hospitalization at some time? No. no. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's an ind individual um, thing. We, we have, the, I think the psychiatric hospitalizations are, are minimal in, in our office um, from our population. Um, like I said, a lot of times I feel like we can um, do earlier intervention um, and take care of medications or figure out why, what the cause of the behaviors are. Um, but I feel like it's, it's a minim, minimal number that actually go into the hospital. Yeah, I'd say maybe we have a couple a year from our clinic Yeah. at, at max, um, which is, you know, it's, we're glad we can take care of them that way, but it's certainly not the majority by, by any means. No. Right, we do have a few more minutes for a few more questions if anybody would like to send one in. Um, do you, uh, Dr. Fader or Dr. Susky, have anything else that you would like to add as a result of these questions to our presentation today? The only thing I was going to add, and, and maybe I shouldn't get very personal, but I, I, I was confronted with one time um, where I had a family member that I needed to do uh, an admission for, um, and I was in residency at the time, and um, as a physician, I'm a fixer, right? Um, and I thought I could fix the behaviors on my own, and um, I tried and tried, and it was actually the, the psychiatric hospitalization once I finally kind of ripped off the Band-Aid and said, you need to go, um, that the hospitalization was the thing that helped him more than what I could do. And I was even in the medical profession. So I, I, I think that sometimes we, like I said, we think we're, you know, we're fixers in that we can, we can take care of it, but sometimes we need more help. So, and it's like Dr. Fader said, it's not, you know, admitting that you're failing. It's just that they need more. Well, suppose um, your particular area really doesn't have a psychiatric facility like Western Pennsylvania. Um, you know, how does a family really cope with a person who um, really doesn't want or doesn't recognize that they need help and uh, is really kind of aggressive and resistant? What options are there for a family um, in that circumstance? Well, I think you can talk with the the psychiatry people that may be associated with the, the local center um, and see if there's anything in in the in their area that's um, available. Like I said, for instance, we have this crisis team that goes in, into the patient's home and assess if they need to have an involuntary um, hospitalization, and they will do the commitment themselves. Um, so, and these are people that may not want to come in um, using, you know, using the telemedicine resources is, is a good thing that we are doing now um, and may not have been available before. Um, so. Yeah, the, the uh, Pennsylvania is actually really, really um, fortunate in having the county crisis teams. Not, not all states have the level of mental health support that we do, um, but uh, telepsychiatry or telemedicine at this point is, is a good option. Um, and, and yeah, your local center of excellence or, or nearest center of excellence can probably help with resources as well. We do have another question. Um, this, uh, this time with COVID restrictions of patients who are in nursing homes and other facilities has been even more devastating for our HD family members. Can you discuss how to deal with HD residents feeling they have been abandoned and don't understand the restrictions due to the pandemic? That's a very good question. Really hard. Um, I mean, it just, you know, each facility has their own protocols. Like some are uh, quarantining to rooms and some do it to floors and some just do it to buildings. So, you know, we do have patients that are in their rooms um, and not communicating with their families as much. and. Um, you know, I think that moods have definitely changed with, with the whole pandemic. Uh, can't just reach out and hug somebody like you used to. And, 
um, now we have to social distance it and um, and that you know this is this is a time of uncertainty and um, like I said just how some of these facilities are um, doing their restrictions I mean it's it's facility to facilities facility to facility based, um, but it, it's been a problem with HD Parkinson's. I mean, it's with, with all comers, um, but yeah, I mean, we have had some problems with our patients that, you know, just they don't understand why, um, and it could be that lack of insight um, or awareness, um, and it, it, it is hard, um, and so we try to try to keep up with some of these patients. We know who's in the facilities. Um, and then if uh, reaching out to them a little bit more frequently could be something that we can do or seeing if meds need to be changed. But this is this is definitely a really hard thing for us that we, I don't know if we have a grasp on it just quite yet over these past several months. Yeah, no, it's it's hard. Um, the I think uh, a lot of facilities have um, tablets where you can do, say, Zoom or, or Skype or, you know, mm -hmm. video calls with with patients, and maybe you need the facility to facilitate that. Um, if they don't have it, if you have the resources actually to provide the patient with, with technology like that so that you can communicate with them and face-to-face, -face, even if it's not in person, that I think can be helpful. Um, frequent phone calls. Um, yeah, but it's hard. It's really hard. We have one final question directed to Dr. Susky. Did <laughs> you rotate? <laughs> did you rotate through the Duke HD clinic? Um, so I did not because at the time that I did my fellowship, um, the majority of the patients went to uh, Wake Forest, so there wasn't a, an official HD clinic then. So that shows my age, and the fact <laughs> that Dr. Fader said that I trained him also showed my age, so thanks on that. <laughs> well, thank you both very much. We are just about out of time, and I, I do want to thank both of you. Um, many of our attendees here today have also sent thanks through the chat box uh, for the time that you've taken and for your sharing of your expertise. They found it very helpful. So thank you for taking the time today, and uh, we hope that you do take the opportunity to review this presentation when it's available on the HDSA YouTube channel in about a week. Thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.